Welcome to Interoperability Roundtable. This is an open forum fostering conversations around interoperability and the importance of timely integrated provider data. I'm Jake Tunney, Director of Payer Solutions at Leap Orbit. I'll be your MC today. And our discussion today focuses on why we should be looking at provider data quality as a key way to influence STARS ratings. Interoperability Roundtable is sponsored by Leap Orbit the trusted innovation partner to many of the biggest market-leading health data networks, including CRISP, Manifest Medics, and Sync Health, as well as the policymakers who oversee them. Our provider data product conversion is the first buyer native automated provider data management platform. Convergent optimizes provider data to ensure members and regulators are happy. And we're joined today by host David Finney, co-founder of Leap Orbit, David is a healthcare technology expert who has been driving innovative programs in healthcare for over a decade. And today we are also joined by second time guest, Barry Volan. Barry is the CEO of the Managed Care Resource Alliance, AKA MICRA. And MICRA fosters opportunities between members and the managed care industry. His professional career spans 35 years, specializing in managed care operations and consulting. Barry has a demonstrated track record in Medicaid, Medicare, special needs plans, MLTC plans, and fully integrated program startup with a focus on strategic development, management, growth, service area expansion, process improvement, and financial turnarounds. Having served in a variety of executive roles, including the CEO for Aetna Better Health of New Jersey and Centers Plan in New York, He's demonstrated a successful execution for plan development in managed care organizations. Now, before we get into the rest of the show, let's do a quick poll and see what strategies folks are currently employing to influence CAP scores. So let me pull up my poll here. I think I'll have to reclaim the host in order to do that. So let me, well, first time for everything running a poll, guys. <laughs> I, I um, Jake, why don't you post it in the chat? Yeah, let's do that. I, I think the, the intention of the poll was for um, us to get some feedback on what type of strategies folks are currently employing to influence CAP scores. So if you'd like, drop in the chat, type out what you're seeing, what you're working on. I'll post the question there again. Um, but yeah, please um, use the chat throughout the talk as well today to um, drop any questions that you might have or comments on the material. Um, so I'll go, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you, David, um, to go from there. Sounds good, Jake. Thank you. Um, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, Barry, I appreciate you. Uh, you might be the first uh, repeat guest on on Leap Orbit's interoperability roundtable, so we're excited to have you. It's it's also a very special day at Leap Orbit. It is Leap Day. Um, only comes around for every four years that the uh, the world celebrates Leap Orbit, and um, we're excited to share with you. So. Um, if you'll if you'll indulge me for a minute, this is a topic that has um, been inter of interest to me for for some time. Um, I have this theory, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. Um, that uh, that there's a link between between provider data and network quality, um, and uh, and and stars ratings um, and and cap scores in particular, but but. Um, I, I'm hoping we can dig into this a little bit, and uh, maybe by the end of this conversation, we can decide whether this um, this theory that I have has any merit. Um, I, I guess what got me thinking about stars and and how stars re relate to to our domain provider data, some of these splash, splashy headlines that we've seen vary over the last year. Um, about the the winners and losers in the MA market, um, and there's some you know some huge numbers when you look at the 
you, know, you look at the national carriers that are in, in the Medicare Advantage space um, about how much money is on the table um, when, when plan stars you know, move up and down half, half a star. A uh, billion dollars uh, in one direction for Kaiser is a is billion dollars in the other direction for, for Aetna in 2023. And, um, you know, not only are these driving um, uh, premiums, uh, but they're also driving in enrollment numbers. Uh, people seem to make decisions e either in a way that's correlated to, um, to product star ratings uh, or, or maybe in, in some way uh, impacted by them directly because consumers are doing their homework. Um, so what, like, I've kind of been picking at this. This is not my area of expertise kind of historically, but um, what does it really mean for not the Aetna or, or the, um, the Kaiser, but for a smaller MA plan, um, if, if a half a star fluctuation in one direction um, kind of hits the business in, in a given year. And um, I, I found some some research about this it's like for, for a 100,000 member MA plan, um, the impact of losing half a star is, is 15 million bucks in, in lost revenue in the year of the change. So you know, 100,000 members, not a huge plan um, in the scheme of things, but, but that's, that's big numbers. Um, hey, David, can I add one thing to that? Yeah, sure. It's not just a revenue loss. But in some cases, that revenue goes to fund supplemental benefits like dental or vision services. Absent that revenue creates a real problem for that health plan in staying competitive in the market because they can no longer afford to offer some of those supplemental benefits. So it's a, it's a real race to ensure they maintain or improve their star scores so that they can continue to be competitive. It's, it's not just a matter of the pure revenue. It's what the revenue goes to. Interesting. Okay. Um, so I, the, other, the other thing that's, that I've been reading about in, in the trade headlines, Barry, is the, um, the adjustment in the, in the composition of the scoring um, year to year. And um, you know, I, I don't think this is a coincidence. Um, but CMS is is doubling down on the weight of uh, member experience in particular. Uh, and if you kind of look at how all of this um, kind of gets baked into the cake and, and it gets graded on a curve, um, increasingly member experience and, and you know, the 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 leading way, well, the, the primary way that member experience is being measured in the context of of stars is is in cap service, um, and you know, the, for for the for the star measurement year 2024 um, member experience measurement is going to be over 50 percent um, of the calculation that that drives um, the drive stars with with most of that coming from caps. Um, also, just to add color to that, prior to the public health emergency and COVID. Most of STARS was driven by clinical transactional data. So either a primary care physical was completed or it wasn't. There was some additional follow-up done to a client rather after a, a, a discharge, a post-discharge. Now we've moved to doubling the weight, as you said, on the more subjective impressions that a client has about the care that they've received or how engaged the, the plan is with that, that client which becomes a far more difficult value to measure. Yeah. Um, well, and maybe this is a good point to just step back for a second. I don't, I don't wanna make too many assumptions about the audience's kind of um, domain knowledge. What, what is CAPS, Barry? Just a, just a quick rundown of it. It's what... essentially a survey tool that's used um, by CMS or uh, by CMS to evaluate the, the the, the health plan's enrollee's perception of the care that they're getting. It's done on a random basis. It's done every year. And we can only speculate on what the outcome is 
based on our own internal surveys on a random basis also. Okay, that's helpful. And and my understanding of CAPS is that um, you know, CMS has its own flavor of CAPS that it uses to evaluate the, the MA market, but but CAPS is also an important part of, of NCQA accreditation, right? A absolutely. Um, absolutely. And you can see on NCQA site, you can see four-star plans that have two and a half stars around patient experience. The detail is all there. So Barry, I guess, um, you know, my, my theory of this case is that um, when you look at the questions that, that folks are asked in, in a CAPS survey, um, mm -hmm. there are a number of them that are about, um, are you able to find the provider of your choice? Mm -hmm. um, are you able to get an appointment in a reasonable time frame? Um, you know, where I sit as someone who's kind of buried in, in provider data for a lot of the, a lot of the time, um, th those to me sound like provider data issues. Um, but, but I, I don't know. I mean, do, do you buy this connection that I'm trying to draw between, um, between these two issues? So I'm in a really unique position, um, in that I've spent my career on the managed care side. And, and um, the last year I, I relocated, retired from the industry, and I am now a, a member, a patient, trying to access those uh, data points and trying to make the same decisions that our members are making. Um, we moved from New Jersey to Florida, and um, I left longstanding relationships with providers that I had a great deal of confidence and trust in, came down to a new marketplace and tried to find doctors. And I, I will tell you, it is a very frustrating um, and, and anger producing process. And let me share with you why. There are a number of large medical groups and advantage plans in the Florida market. So it's not like Florida is any more or less unique than most other markets. And I did what most people did or do. I looked, I identified a number of providers that were available, got some local recommendations from friends and people I trusted, and then called the medical group and was quickly directed to use their online provider directory to find providers. Well, I did that. And more times than not, I would call based on the information that was given to me and was told, well, they're not accepting new patients, or they don't take my insurance information, or because I've got some chronic issues like many retirees do, I was interested in where they would where they would deliver their procedures, what hospitals they were affiliated with. Again, more times than not, either the, the data wasn't there or um, it was incorrect. And it got to a point where I literally threw up my hands and just said, I, I just can't deal with this. And, and I started to pursue other avenues, uh, literally knocking on doors to find out what the truth was. Um, if I were looking at an advantage plan today, I, I, would, I, I would have really second thoughts because for me as a consumer now, if the data they're providing to me to make my initial decisions about participating with the plan or not is, is not correct, then what's my level of confidence and anything else they're going to provide to me is going to provide me with a, a, a level of confidence. You know, it's interesting, just as an aside, I, I do what everybody down here does. I play pickleball, and I find that my pickleball partners spend more time in looking for sneakers on Amazon. And what, what I hear from them is that when they go to the Amazon website, they not only get the color, the size, the shape, the fit, the, and every other detail about that sneaker before they buy it, and there's a level of confidence that when they buy it, it's going to do exactly what Amazon has said. I wish we had that level of confidence in a provider directory or the provider information that's provided to us as consumers. It, it doesn't make me feel any better. And quite frankly, as somebody who's come out of the industry, it's pretty embarrassing that we can't get this right. So in, in, in the long way that answer to your question is I absolutely believe that provider satisfaction and, and health plan engagement with a 
a member is is absolutely tied to the data that's provided to me at the, as I'm onboarded. It, it's striking to me as someone who, you know, you Barry, you spent a career um, as a as a health plan executive trying to, um, you know, run a business, obviously, but but cultivate a certain kind of experience with, with membership. And um, what I'm hearing you describe is um, incredibly transactional where, where you're sitting on the other side of the fence. Like, is there a product that's going to get me? it's going to be expedient and and meet the sort of narrow needs that I have. Um, and, and if there are a zillion MA plans, um, you know, in some ways, could you care less which one you pick? And maybe you'll pick a different one next year based on how how good or terrible the experience is in the in the given year. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, it's it's very frustrating. Um, when, when a health plan or a broker presents to me and talks to me about joining a plan, there's a leap of faith that I as a customer are taking. My leap of faith is that I'm making decisions based on accurate information. And the one that's most important to me is, is my doctor in that health plan? Mm -hmm. And, that, and that's the first rule they tell you. That's the first rule brokers will tell a potential customer. And if we can't get that right, then, then why would I even pursue that relationship? And if I'm in the plan and now I'm in need of some additional services, if I can't get the information as to who is and who isn't in the plan, who participates, who doesn't, what hospitals they're affiliated with, how can I make consumer-centric decisions around where I'm going to get my care if, if everything is constantly changing. So for me, health plans traditionally have maintained from a compliance standpoint, a regulatorily approved provided directory. They update it once every year, once every six months. But, but there are real changes that occur day to day. And as a consumer, I have needs day to day, especially yeah. in healthcare. Yeah. How do I make those intelligent consumer decisions if I don't have the, the, the data to do that? And, and just as an aside, why do I get a claim from the health plan for a bill for a provider that I went to that their directory said is in the plan and the provider said, no, I'm not. So, it, I know I'm laying out a very frustrating proposition to you, but this is real. This is what the consumer goes through. Get rid of all those administrative burdens and I'll be a happy guy. Let me go to my doctor. Let me get much care that I need. Let the doctor provide the services that, that he or she determines I need. And let me do it without all this noise. So um, I, I'm listening to this and I'm, and I'm imagining... Um, you know, your your phone rings uh, this evening and, um, you know, I, I, just as an aside, I've heard another challenge with this increasing emphasis on cap scores is that it's it's just a lot harder these days than it was to to get people on the phone um, and to get people to talk like, but but let's let's say you pick up the call, right? And they're, and they're calling and they say, hey, Mr. Bullen, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your experience with your with your insurance carrier, um, I, you know, it's it's obvious to me that the frustration you're expressing now would be reflected in the in the answers that you that you would give. Um, but but let's like let's unpack that from the health plan executive side for a second, right? Like you, your cap scores come back. Um, the 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 message is clear to anyone who who looks at it that um, you've got a member experience problem. Um, like what, what's the playbook or what, what was the playbook when you were in the business to try to, to try to deal with that? So there are a couple of simple steps I would take. Number one is I'd, I'd relook at the operations in, in our call center, because when I think about it, the, the face to the public are my call center agents. And obviously if my members aren't happy, there's gotta be something wrong in my call center. Hmm. 
So that would be the primary focus. I would go in there. I would look at better education there. I would look at how calls are triaged, how they're handled, period. That would be my first step. I might look at things like appeals and grievances, but what I never do is take a step back and look at the organization and look at what the implications are. I don't look at how I onboard members. I don't look at those things. I look at the transactions. And because organizations are typically structured in this siloed fashion where you've got clinical activities separate apart from provider activities, separate apart from the call center, very few organizations will take a step back and look at this globally, look at how all the pieces operate together. It, it, it sounds to me that there's some timing issues there. I mean, th these, the, the, the sort of, the, the financial impact of your star rating, you know, plus or minus, um, it, 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 it hits on a lag, right? Two, two years, what, whatever you want to call it, like two, two, three years. Um, the steps you're describing are, are reactive. Yep. Um, and so you're, it, it seems like you're, you're treating symptoms in a way. Um, and by the time you realize you've got, by the time you're able to evaluate whether you've gotten any return on the investments you're making, like maybe you rip out your call center vendor and you bring in somebody else and you train them all up and, and you say, that's going to solve my problem. Like you're, you're in a multi-year investment cycle there before you really know whether you um, have had any ability to, to drive your numbers. It's absolutely true. And, and what's key to the, to the problem, you, you said it very well, is we're reactive. And where health plans have to go is to be proactive and get in front of the problem. Um, being reactive, you're always on the tail end. You'll never improve your SCAR scores to where you want to be. You need to get ahead of the, the, the curve and understand what's going on in your marketplace, be able to, to manage that and, and be able to do that proactively. You want to prevent the problem from occurring. And, and the simple adage that I always use is it's not so much member retention that we're focused on. It's how do we stimulate member loyalty? And to do that, that, that starts on day one with, with it, it, the initial um, introduction of the plan to the member, whether it be at the broker site or it be at the onboarding, all the data has to be there. Essentially, again, you go back to when a member joins, there's two things a member counts on on day one. Number one, receipt of their ID card, which gives them access to the health care they need. And number two, their provider directory, which gives them access to the providers they need. Absent those two things, everything else becomes a hassle. I didn't join a plan to be hassled. I joined a plan to get my health care. Hmm. So until we can ensure those two things occur, we're always going to have this problem. And it's always going to be a trailing problem. We need to get ahead of it. The idea of, of members being loy loyal to their health plan almost seems um, farcical. Like I'm, I'm, I don't mean to like make a joke of it, but it no. seems I, I've never met anybody that that has even probably thought of the it, the relationship that way. It's like you know being loyal to the to the DMV or something. Like you just expect you expect it to not go well. Well, let, let me give you two other other examples that are out of this industry, but clearly similar. You know, I think about some of the larger retail stores like a Nordstrom's that charges, they, they charge premium dollars, except their service level. You expect their service level to be high, and it is. And you ask people why they shop there. It's because they get service unlike they do in any other large retail store. And they expect it, and, and, and Nordstrom's has made a commitment to delivering that level of detail and that level of service to their members. On the other hand, you look at Disney. Disney goes through annual price changes. I can't believe how expensive it is to go to Disney. And Disney's basic adage is, although we see 35 to 40,000 people every day in the parks, 
our, our basic philosophy is we want to create 35 to 40,000 individual experiences for our, our customers so that each of them continue to come back and spend the money and enjoy themselves. I can't understand why we can't take that same type of customer focus and apply it in the health plan world. Yeah, but that's, that's that would be my vision of where we want to go with this. Well, I mean, just to torture your your Nordstrom analogy for a mm -hmm. minute, um, you know, they're 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 putting a product in front of the customer, right? Um, yeah. There there are a bunch of ingredients that that are required to do that in a way that makes the customer delighted. Um, one is you got to pick the right product, right? And, and you know the the analogy here in some ways is yeah the benefit design and other things like that, but but you got to make sure that you've got docs in the network who um, who meet the who meet the needs of the community. Um, mm -hmm. But but you've also got to you've you've got to have the right supply chain, right? Like you you can have all the all the coolest stuff in the catalog but if you can't if it's on back order or you you know you're not stocking the shelves um you're gonna have customers that go elsewhere um and i i feel like that's kind of the same thing right like part of part of what a health plan does is at its core is it um is it curates a supply of of care that meets the need of the market um, and it makes sure that it's available at the time that it's that that somebody's ready to purchase it or use it. Um, and and so like you know network um, development and network composition is part of it. But I, I think that sort of supply chain piece is how do you take the network and make sure that it's presented to the customer in a in an accurate, timely, um, usable way. Well, it, that, that's a sore point for me um, in that, in, in my experience, provider service responsibility has primarily been, I pick up a box of Joe and a dozen donuts and bring them out to the doctor's office on a Wednesday morning. My, my question to the doctor is, how are things going? Leave my coffee, leave my donuts and go back. I've often wondered why health plans don't commit to the success of the doctor's office if the doctor has a high rate of denial on claims, why are we out there instructing the provider on how to bill correctly? How to, we, we want that doctor to be as successful as possible. And, and again, if I had to use kind of a symbolic logic here, the traditional relationship with providers is that they sit across the table from the health plan we negotiate around a fee structure for the services that they may or may not do, but nowhere do we talk about quality outcomes. We need to get the provider, the health plan, and the member all on the same side of the table, all negotiating around the desired clinical outcome. And that includes client engagement, client satisfaction. It also includes satisfaction on the side of the provider. We're providing information to the provider as they are to, to us. And full transparency, we're far from that now. So um, one of the reasons why I think I've been intrigued by this, this conversation, Barry, is um, you know on, on our journey as, as a, a provider data automation business, um, we, we talk with a lot of frontline and sort of middle management folks within health plans who experience all of the various kind of types of pain um, that result from these issues. Um, you know, whether it's it's credentialing people, it's networks op, network ops people, it's provider relations people, it's IT people. Um, there, there are all these flavors of people who are, um, who know that this is a problem and are sending out, um, you know, sending out forms, looking for, for providers to mail back their information. And then when you press them, they confess, yeah, we, we just throw all those away, which is a true, a true story, by the way. Um, or, or people making, you know, people in a, in a call center making phone calls to try to update provider demographics when they could be taking better care of members instead. Um, so th there's a lot of pain out there in, in or within the walls of the health plan. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think, you know, when you sort of add all of that up, there's some 
apathy or some cynicism in the more senior reaches of health plan leadership where they they say you know what like this the the net, the, the providers don't know what contracts they're in and that's the problem um or how dare a provider say he's not taking our patients he's required to um or yeah you know we've always had the um the people in the basement that take care of this with the bubble gum and the and the duct tape right and, and it's kind of just like it, it's it's problem 11 or 12 or 13 on the top 10 for the year mm -hmm. and, and, and so like part part of what interests me um about this like trying to draw a straight line between um poor management practices around provider data and um and caps and stars and, and ultimately financial drivers of the business is to say you know hey hey barry you know thanks for making time for me you got a beautiful office with a great view of the city like this is something that that is is really um uh a, a driver of your of your business fundamentals and and the kpis that you care about um, and and why would you not want to um, pro proactively invest in these things instead of um, you know kind of playing the the member satisfaction whack a mole that you've been playing? So I, that's my that's my soapbox. I, I don't know if you I, I don't know if you think that there's that there's really a case there. I I think you do from if nothing else from being on the member side more recently. So I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, there, there are a number of things. Um, I, I think we need to elevate the issue to, to be more global in nature than, than departmentally focused. You know, when I think about the, the supervisor in the call center complaining about, I got a dozen phone calls today from a variety of providers around a, a single issue. I'm not sure where that goes. Yeah. I'm not sure how far up it goes and whether or not it's handled as a group of individual phone calls rather than as a systemic problem. And, and that's, a, that's a real concern because that is a systemic problem that should be resolved at the system level, not at the transactional level. And we have, we have many of those things occur in health plans. I'd, I'd love to hear what others have experienced, but... My fear is if we open that Pandora's box, you're going to find a lot of frustration in a lot of organizations. The, the other thing is that this is a new set of, of measures. The whole idea of customer engagement, customer satisfaction, customer perception. And, and I just think, I can't help but think out loud, are we just throwing a set of old solutions and old approaches at a new set of problems and not moving the needle at all? Or if we move it, it's more out of, of, of random occurrence than out of any real cause and effect. And do we need to really start to look at this as a new set of problems requiring a new approach and a new solution? Because for me, the old approach just isn't, isn't getting us the results at the time we want. Let me, let me just go on one more thing. Um, and, and that is anybody in the, in the Medicare space has seen the most recent studies for 2025 is showing some significant reductions in premium dollars. And that's going to impact the ability of a lot of health plans and how they manage, how they run, how they invest their money. And continuing to spend money on old solutions, very narrow solutions, haven't delivered what our hopes are yet. I would, I would want to go back and reevaluate them in terms of my, my investment and my return on them and look at what new solutions can be offered and how new approaches can offer and what my expected returns would be there. But to continue to throw money at old solutions that aren't delivering anything to you, the only thing it gives you is the ability to go to your board and say, yeah, here are the three things we're doing to make improvements, but sorry, we haven't delivered the product, but right. we've got a solution in place. So I think it requires leadership to refocus and rethink about how they want to approach this. Well, there there are two kind of macro trends that 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 I have in mind, and and one of them aligns nicely with something you shared with me this morning, which was JD Power's kind of latest macro trends in healthcare. But but 
the the first one that's that's not on that list that's on my mind is just um, CMS seems determined uh, in a way that you don't typically see a, feg a federal regulator determined on an issue over a you know a period of time that transcends um, a change in political leadership and and ch changes in congressional control um, around imp um, creating a an incentive structure for all health plans, but especially you know in the in the Medicaid and Medicare space where they have more carrots and sticks yep. um, that that really re revolves around member experience. And I, and I look at the CMS inter interoperability rule. I look at No Surprises Act. I look at the continued uh, adjustment to the way that that star ratings are calculated with emphasis on um, clearly similar things. And I just say, um, this is headed in one direction, and the and the bridges are being burned behind the you know the way that things used to be. So I feel like the trajectory is clear there, um, and it's only going to get tougher. Um, and then and then the other thing, which is is related, is that c consumers are now used to, and I think demand across a lot of industries, including their health insurer, uh, like a, di a digital first experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're of different generations, but, you, you know, you retire to Florida and, and you, you expect that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if, you're, if your knee-jerk reaction to fixing a member experience problem is to retrain your call center, um, you, you're, you're missing a trick there, I think. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to add to the list that you just said, if you look at what CMS has been focused on over the last four or five years, things like social determinants of health, which was really nobody spoke about that prior to four or five years ago. Health equity. These, these are all soft measures that are all tied into engagement and experience. And there aren't any quick and dirty, easy key transactional metrics to see, am I doing this or am I not doing this? It, it all comes down to the experience that, that the member perceives because for them, perception is reality. And, and oftentimes it's very frustrating because you could say, I've done everything that from a regulatory standpoint I was required to do, yet the member had a terrible experience. You know, I reference, I, I reference anyone who's listening, when you, get an EOB from your insurance company on a claim that was processed and paid, if you could read it and understand it, and I've been in the business for 35 years and I still don't understand it, what does it mean? Especially one that comes to you and says, this is not a bill, then why am I getting this? Right. But we live in a world of, and, and I'm not in any way dismissing the importance of being compliant and, and living within regulation but we forget that we're serving a population and that it's the population that we're serving that we have to message and, and communicate with. We don't do that. We, we communicate in a fashion that meets regulatory standards, period. That is our goal. We need to move beyond that. We need to be compliant, but, but use that as the floor of our, of our performance and move well past that to the customer. We, we've, we've lost sight of that, and that's unfortunate. To your point on, on digital, there isn't a friend of mine that doesn't order, watch TV, do things, make reservations without their phone. When I want to make an appointment with my doctor, I go to my phone and I make an appointment. Everybody I know does that. So unless I have a digital experience that allows me to do that and do that in a fashion that when I make the appointment, number one, the doctor is there. Number two, that the time is correct. That's my expectation. If it's not, then, then I'm wasting my time. And that's something I don't want to do. Well, well and Amazon is kind of the gold standard in some ways of um, th their online experience is so customer centric and so yep. effective and um, so reliable. that They make it nearly impossible to call anybody on the phone. You don't have to. Um, right, exactly. I mean, return, they made, if I have a bad experience and I want to return something, boy, that is the easiest return process I've ever seen. 
You know, I'll, I'll cite another uh, online service, and that's um, I, I saw this on the Super Bowl. Timu, which is is this? I think I believe they're the Chinese version of Amazon. When you order something from China through Timu, I get daily updates on exactly where the product is in the delivery process. Mm. So I don't mind waiting two weeks for it because every day I'm getting updated. Right. Why can't we do that in, in the healthcare area? We make it so difficult. Data, data should be hidden. It needs to be transparent and it's need to have a level of accuracy that, that allows those decisions to make to be made. Yeah, well said. Right? Well, imagine if you went to Amazon and half the products that you wanted to buy, you actually couldn't buy. Yeah. How, yeah. How, how, how many people would be using Amazon at that point? Or, or Jake, I order something in red and it comes in blue. Or it doesn't come the right size. But, but that's what the customer experience is today in healthcare. Yep. It gets more and more frustrating. And it's not that I'm being a demanding client, nor, nor are my, my, my contemporaries, but our expectation is such that if you're representing some data fields about a provider, that they're accurate. And if that's too high a standard to expect, then we all have some issues around healthcare. Yeah, well, well said. Um, so I, I just put, um, th these are actually the questions uh, of the current CAP survey, um, just as kind of a, a gut check after this, you know, this discussion, are we kind of buying this idea um, that we're, that we're laying out? And I, you know, I, if we think about the, the, the healthcare provider as the product, and, and all the, the data and the IT that delivers accurate data to the member as sort of a supply chain, or at least part of the supply chain. Um, you know, I, I kind of look at these questions around um, getting appointments. Um, is it easy to get care? Um, are you satisfied with the choices that you have? Um, th there's just no question in my mind that if you're if you're falling down on on accuracy and and um, actionability of of your provider data, you're 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 falling down um, on on these survey questions too. There's just no question. Yeah, I, I would I would even suggest to all, all the listeners when you go back to your respective organizations, pull up your own provider directory, pull out any specialists in your directory, an orthopedic surgeon cardiac surgeon, any invasive specialist, and see where they deliver their services, if it's listed at all. Um, more times than not, it's not. And that's a problem. And ask yourself, how would you make a decision about where you would go for a knee replacement or where you want to, in the Medicaid space, where would you deliver a baby if you didn't know where the, the OB was delivering? So I, I, again, I go back to how do you make those decisions and how do you value the member in, in helping them make those decisions? Yeah, I want to um, want to make sure we leave some time for questions, um, but I, I want I, I've been thinking about um, as we've been talking sort of how do we how do we make this discussion actionable for folks that might be listening in. Um, and I, and I, 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 just from looking at the attendee list, I know a number of the people that are listening today are some of those kind of frontline folks in health plans that, that we know are um, kind of in the, in the hand-to-hand -hand combat of one, one part of this whole challenge of, of trying to bring an accurate network to the member. Um, and, and they feel pain um, but they also struggle, I think, to to elevate this issue to to leadership and 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 make it sort of investable at the enterprise level. Um, so you know, I, some of these questions are, are really about um, corporate strategy. Um, you know, what 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 is what is the plan's goal around Star 
uh, ratings and cap scores. Um, are you playing defense? Are you trying to make sure that you don't lose half a star in the next cycle? Or, or are you leaning in? And, and what are the levers that you're really trying to pull there um, in, in, order to, in order to meet your goal? Um, and, and how do you financialize that? How do you qu quantify that? What, what, are, what is the turnover that's driven by poor satisfaction? What's the revenue that's at stake here? And, and to your point at the beginning, Ferry, what, what, are the, what are the services that get taken off the board um, in, the, in the face of lost revenue that, that can compound the, the, uh, the member turnover? Um, and, and then is there a way to draw, <clears throat> to draw a line between the provider data issues and some of those sort of fundamental you know, cor corporate objectives? Um, if there is, I, I can bet that if you look at what the plan's doing um, to try to manage, um, you know, member experience, um, you know, you, you can put a number on that and you can say, what is that number? What's, what's the plan investing every year in, um, in, in upskilling their call center or, or replacing the call center vendor? Um, or, or whatever, you know, those other activities that folks may are kind of in the member experience playbook. And how are you measuring the ROI there? Um, you know, from my perspective, those are all lagging indicators. Like what, by the time you get, by the time you get your scores back, your survey results back, it's, it's too late. Like it's, it's a point in time in the past and you're, you're managing to the next round. Um, so how do you, start to make this argument that um, let's focus on on the upstream causes here and 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 try to get a wrangle on um, on leading indicators instead of um, instead of fighting the battle that you know that already happened and already ended um, yeah I would I would just add to that do your own surveys ask your members and and don't ignore their their criticism or their negative comments, embrace those and use those as the basis for developing a process improvement strategy, which really runs the gamut. Ask your members. These aren't gonna complain a lot because they're fearful that they're gonna be thrown out of the plan. But you need to be able to figure out how to survey them around their experience and do it in a way that doesn't present any sort of a threat to them. And whether that's done telephonically, whether it's done face to face, there are a variety of ways of surveying. But you need to get an insight from your clients on what you're doing right and what you're not doing right. Yeah, and I think I think I'd be remiss here not to mention how convergent can make this uh, a proactive process instead of a reactive process. Because, you know, the CAPS surveys are historically a qualitative measure, but what we can do is sort of turn um, provider data into a quantitative metric that you can control and track as a, as a proxy measure towards improving CAPS. Uh, and that, that, when I say tracking provider data quality, that you know includes things like accuracy, but it also includes things like completeness, enrichment. So how much information you can give to your members to help them make informed decisions, um, as well as timeliness. So that that extends into things like integrations between systems and um, making sure that the claim system is talking to the provider directory so that no surprise bills go out. Um, and I noticed um, our friend Keith Summers here at Health Quorum mentioned quality. So how can you um, steer members to providers that have higher quality that we have a higher likelihood of them having a good experience when they end up getting to that appointment? So I think that's a really good point, Keith. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's more to explore on that. So I feel like that's probably a good segue to opening up Q&A. So if there are any more questions or, or comments on, on today's conversation, please drop them in the Q&A. Um, 
happy to spend some time discussing those. Um, so I'll, we'll just wait here for a few minutes um, as some of those ideas percolate. Um, if there's no questions, we'll maybe we'll just wrap it up. But um, Barry, it was a pleasure um, as always. And David, thank you. thank you as well. And thanks to everybody who came out today. Appreciate you joining us. Um, sure, we'll have the recording available sometime soon. Um, huh, I'm not seeing any questions come in. So what do you guys think? Should we wrap it up or do you have any parting parting comments or words of wisdom? No, I, Barry, I really appreciate you making the time to chat with us today. Um, you have uh, wisdom as always, and um, at, you know your recent experience as a as a consumer in a, in a whole new geography is um, totally relevant to this discussion. So um, appreciate it as always, and let's do it again. Love to. Um, as I hope you saw, I'm passionate about this. Um, as a consumer and as a, a, a prior exec, I. It, it's so important. We're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot and we, we have to stop. But David, Jake, thank you very much for the opportunity. I love doing this with you guys and uh, look forward to doing it again. Thanks, guys. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah.